right? Okay, Constance. Yeah, I'm gonna introduce you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna give you a layup. Yeah. So I met Mark a few weeks ago for the first time. I was, I was in awe. His experience, you guys are up for a treat because this guy has been in the fields negotiating in the oil business. He's been in Iraq, Dubai, he's been all over the world. So when I was asked to do this with him, I was like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> we've got a real negotiator here, right? I'm just a fanatic. Yes, I've negotiated a lot of deals, but in my case, we're talking maybe hundreds of thousands. This guy, we're talking millions. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, please. <laughs> Not prepare for that. Otherwise, I'll just dump something back. <laughs> <to> you, but, <laughs> thanks for that. So um, let's start at my university time. I've actually studied my bachelor's and my master's here. I did a uh, bachelor in uh, international business administration. And then I subsequently did a master in innovation management. Why? because I didn't really like to do finance or marketing like everyone else was doing. So I went for the small master uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. Didn't use any of it in my future career. But anyway, that's besides the point because basically you will learn everything once you start working anyway. And some of you, I believe, already are at it being alumni. Um, I started my career at Shell, uh, joined the graduate program. And within a year, they sent me to Iraq, which was supposed to be a uh, uh, nearly a promotion. Didn't really feel like it being there. Um, but at that point, I was made responsible for ridiculous amount of money and to negotiate uh, sizable deals with no formal training in negotiations, which is already quite bizarre that a large corporate like Shell would entrust a 26-year-old with negotiating a deal of over $200. Um, I learned by doing, and I had a lot of interesting events happen to me. Uh, that same negotiation, someone turned around, pulled off their pants and told me, I'm not gonna describe what they told me, but you can fill in the blanks. Um, and at that moment, kind of a bizarre moment, I was like, this is fantastic. Not <laughs> what I was seeing, but the dynamics of negotiations, it is passion, it is emotion, it is, results um and i've then turned that into my career i left shell i joined the gap partnership which is worldwide one of the largest negotiation training companies um i first gave trainings then and then i moved into uh, the consulting bit at the gap left joined the private equity for a year and then two years ago i founded impact negotiation group and we're now with four people uh predominantly based in germany belgium the Netherlands, and france uh, and here to share with you some negotiation insights. So, and Elmer, who I also met a couple of months ago and uh, very much intrigued about his chosen area of expertise, which is presentations, uh, a core or skill everybody should have. Yeah. By show of hands, who of you has ever had a presentation skills training? Okay. By show of hands, who of you, if I were to invite you now to come here on stage with me, who of you feels a little bit of anxiety for that, to come and stand here? Only a few not. All right. There's a big correlation there. Yeah. Usually, if you don't feel that anxiety, you've had some training. Now, I did study here as well. A long time ago, we're getting old. Business administration, then I did sustainability within RSM, global sustainability. And one of the things I really, really missed in my studies are the so-called soft skills. So when I went on to work at KPMG and some other big corporates, what I saw happen was a lot of talented people, nice people with a lot of skills, not really progressing, being unhappy in their in their jobs, feeling like they were underpaid. One of the things I saw, many of them didn't know how to present themselves. Another thing, many of them don't know how to negotiate. 
So I started my own company more than five years ago. And along the way, I've had to hire people, fire people, do amazing things, and obviously make deals. Now I've been a nerd always. Now I'm proud of it. When I was younger, I was less proud of it, of course. <laughs> but I was that kid that would go around the neighborhood, knock on people's door and ask, hey, can we do a chore? Who views Dutch? Yeah, you'll know Heitje for a right? We would do everything. And I would get other kids in the neighborhood, like, hey, can we clean your car? Can we unweed your garden? How much do you pay us for it? And at one point, I found myself kind of running a little business where kids wouldn't show up for their shift. One kid scratched the car. He used, um, what is it called? Like an iron sponge. <laughs> but I was the responsible one. I made the deals with the, with the older people, you know? So they came to me or to my parents. <laughs> they were mostly gone, unfortunately. That's another topic. But my interest for negotiating goes a long way back. And a few years ago, so my bread and butter is in public speaking. Okay, so now all of you are analyzing what is he doing? Is he that good? It's not about being perfect. Let me tell you that. I thought, you know what? I'm negotiating all the time. I'm sure there must be students at the university who are interested in negotiating. So I set up a negotiation course in Liversity. Who of you has heard of Liversity? Some more than I expect this group, because unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about it yet. Set up the negotiation course. I've been doing that for more than three years. And I think in that way, Alice found me. Or not. I don't know if they found me. <laughs> but probably because of former students there of mine. And when I got the request to do this, of course, first of all, to do it with Mark, that's already an honor for me. And second of all, the more people can learn a little bit about negotiation, the more happy, satisfied and effective those people are going to be. This is the one thing we agree on. We agree on many things is that it's a shame that you don't learn these things in school and university. High school, I would say. Then in high school, yeah. So today we're going to talk about some of the fundamentals. Yeah, we're going to do that in a conversational style with each other. Of course, there will be moments where Mark will have the spotlight, I will have the spotlight, but we're also going to do this in a conversation with you because we are bored. We, we've been where you are now sitting. We've had so many boring presentations in school, right? We've had, so we thought, let's do it in a different way. Let's do it the conversation stuff. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. I'm also here to learn from Mark. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it's a win-win. Yeah. By the way, my voice is a bit cranky, a sore throat. So if you see me, I'm high on strepsils, you know, the <laughs> candy right now. Right. The show of hands. <laughs> Who has been in a negotiation in the past 24 hours? Okay, okay. Uh, surprise, I saw a bit more hands. I, I would actually say every single one of you has been negotiating in the past 24 hours. You may just not have realized that you've been in a negotiation. Uh, who's bought something in a store in the past 24 hours? Any all hands gone up? Well, in fact, that's already a negotiation. You just accepted the price that the retailers is asking you. But if you were to go back to that same Albert Hein and instead of buying one Red Bull, you had to buy a thousand Red Bulls, I bet you you would not agree to those existing terms and that you would go to the store manager and say, hey, can I get a better deal on this? In the first example, you already accepted the terms. Fine. No actual negotiation has taken place. Well, actually it has because Red Bull has been influencing you already for a very, very, very long time to accept the price that they charge for that. Which means that we all negotiate every single day. That's a commercial negotiation. You may be negotiating with your spouse, with your partner, with your kids. 
to twin boys, and trust me, they are good negotiators. They're only five years old. But you negotiate every single day. Now, it starts becoming, in my view, very important when it's also very important in your job, in your career. And the people that excel in negotiation skills will excel in their career. Because it's very simple. You do not get what you deserve in life. It's the truth. You simply, by doing a very, very good job, it's not automatically going to lead to a career progression. I've seen fantastic people in jobs doing great work and get asked for promotions. One of the root causes I find is that they simply don't know how to negotiate for themselves. They don't know how to get ahead. They don't know how to make the demand to get what they want. So negotiation is a fundamental skill, which I truly believe in that everybody should be developing and everybody can learn to become a better negotiator. Now, there is this trend or well trend, it's, it's actually also a reality where there are multiple negotiation styles. And I assume that most of you know that there is this competitive negotiation style or a collaborative negotiation style, right? See some people nodding. So the competitive negotiation style is zero sum, distributive. The pie is fixed. The collaborative negotiation style is where you're looking to create a bigger pie, create value. Now, if I were to ask by a show of hands, who here would describe themselves as a competitive negotiator? Hands up. What? A competitive negotiator as your go-to style. All right. Who would describe themselves as a collaborative negotiator? Ha. Ah. And this is my problem right here with the education system, with universities. They focus, when they focus on negotiation, too much on this concept of win-win, make the world a better place. <laughs> Where does that concept come from? It comes from conflict resolution. It comes from the Harvard Business School, the legal department. And yes, when they negotiate, they're negotiating conflicts. They're negotiating complex deals that have gotten stuck. So you get a bunch of lawyers together and they're like, ah, oh, this sucks. How do we solve this? Well, let's try and find a win-win. But the problem with that is, is that too often I see commercial professionals thinking that all of their negotiations should be win-wins. Whilst the reality is, and that what I've found is that more than 90% of commercial negotiations are in fact competitive negotiations, as per the definition of a competitive negotiation. I would even argue that your job negotiation, a salary negotiation, is one of a competitive negotiation. So, Unless you realize that, and the earlier you do, the better you will get in it. And don't get me wrong here. Wherever you can negotiate collaboratively, by all means, do it. But it requires some fundamental prerequisites to be in place. And what I found is that most people that we educate or guide in their commercial negotiations, those prerequisites are simply not there. And if the prerequisites aren't there to negotiate collaboratively, you need to watch yourself. Because if you go into the negotiation collaboratively whilst the other party is going in competitively, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to lose. They're going to screw you. Yeah. yeah. So that means... Wait, Jordan, before you go on, let me ask. Yeah, sorry. Because I saw some people look like... Mm. When you said the salary negotiation. Yeah. You said collaborative. Can you elaborate? Because this is new information, I think, for a lot of people. So you're not there creating a bigger pie. Most often, you're dealing with HR. HR has a budget. And within that budget, they have to fill that rule. It's fixed. Oftentimes, they can't just say, oh, right, we're going to jointly find new variables and we're going to turn that 100k salary into 200k salary it's not going to happen especially with big corporates because 
They have policies, they have guidelines, they have restrictions. So you're simply not going to create a bigger pie. And yes, the value that you are offering to them is you as a person, but that's what you're already negotiating. True collaborative negotiation, creating a bigger pie, is allowing you to broaden the horizon of the scope of what is being dealt with. If I'm dealing to negotiate on pens, all of a sudden saying, right, but I don't just need pens, I need books as well. Can we make that part of the discussion? That's value creative. Yeah. So you need to understand that most negotiations by that definition are competitive. But competitive has a nasty connotation to it. When I associate competitive behaviors, people are like, oh, I don't like that. I, mm, I don't feel comfortable. People need to like me or I need to build relationships. Not a problem of why a lot of people go in collaborative. Because negotiating competitively has nothing to do with being an asshole. Some people do think that is the way they negotiate, but it's not the reality. Negotiating competitively means you follow a very set rules or guidelines on how you execute the negotiation, the moves you make, how you open, how you react to proposals. So for you, it is very important to first realize what type of negotiation am I in? Maybe a quick exercise. Can everybody get into an arm wrestle move? Maybe turn around and find someone behind you and get in an arm wrestle stand. No, man, I don't want to. Yeah. Okay. So what's going to happen? I'm going to give you exactly. Wow. 10 seconds. And the moment that you are able to push the other person to the table, you give one point. The more points you get, that's the target. So, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to start. Start now. One, two, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stop. There you go. Got to add new variables. Right. <laughs> Who was able to get one point? Hands up. Who was able to get more than one point? Oh, your hand hit the table. Um, what I saw is exactly what happens in negotiations. I mean, that was a competitive negotiation. Both parties pushing against each other. Now... Problem is, what do you think happens if I go to Brandon and I say, Brandon, I want to negotiate collaborative with you. <laughs> and he's constantly pushing me down. He's going to screw me. But if I wanted to maximize the value of the deal, I need to have communicated with Brandon saying, Brandon, we're in it together. We're both. I'm going to make it worth your while. So, oh, oh my God, <laughs> 10 seconds. How many points could we have gotten? But here's the kicker. It requires two to tango. That's collaborative negotiation. Besides that, the other prerequisite that is required is we need to have sufficient joint time together. We need to have come to that discussion. We need to have shared our priorities with one another. I need to have told him that, hey, these are my priorities. My priorities are to maximize value. What are yours? Can I understand? What are your priorities, Brandon? So that we can have that dialogue before we enter into the negotiation. I need to understand this position. And then when there is joint willingness to negotiate collectively, by all means. But then again, those prerequisites of joint time, of trust, of openness, transparency, joint willingness, are oftentimes not there in commercial business negotiations. Why? because you're rushing to get the deal done. You're rushing to, or you do not want to show the back of your teeth because you can't share your strategic direction of the company or whatever nonsense. Can you give us an example? Like how have you personally, because you've been in the field, you've been in. Um, well, the best example that I can share is fictitious deadlines that your management has given you. You need to get the deal done by next month. Okay. Then you reach out to a supplier or a customer and they say, right, but in the next weeks, I only have one time to meet you. Well, 
there you go. You already have a problem to establish the joint time required to truly negotiate collaboratively. And there's no right or wrong. Not misunderstand me here. I'm all for negotiating competitively if I have to. But the thing is that you need to realize is that you need to be able to adapt yourself. You need to be able to negotiate competitively as well as collaboratively. You need to be a chameleon for the situation. So that's my biggest tip for you today. Understand what type of negotiation you're good getting into or where you want it to be. Because the only one that can influence that is you. I saw a question there. Yeah, I was, you were explaining about competitive um, negotiation, but it's all a matter of perception, you know. So if, let's say for salary, one a party will only tell you what they think they have won. Okay, that's a that's a very uh, good point. Let's let's dive into that. What's your name? Andy. Andy. Um, and before I get to you, Andy, question to everyone. How do you want the other party to feel in a negotiation? As they're winning. Hmm? As they're winning. As if they're winning? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, no. How do you want them to feel? Don't really care. You don't really care. <laughs> no, I don't like that. <laughs> they should be, they should, there should be some offer to a solution, but it should be more tangled towards my proposition than to theirs right so but they should accept it it should be expectation at the end yeah maybe i don't want them to leave the table you don't want them to leave the table okay i'm gonna tell you how you want the other party to feel satisfied regardless of the deal they have gotten why because if they're dissatisfied then you run the risk that they might back out of the deal at a later stage, that they might rethink their deal, or worse, that's probably the worst, or they might reconsider to ever doing business with you again, because they might feel screwed over, and then they're dissatisfied, and they think, I'm never going to negotiate with Andy again. To turn that into a concrete uh, example, say Andy is uh, interested in buying a used car, a nice Tesla. He has a budget of 30,000 euros. Andy has been looking online for a while now. All of the Teslas being offered were above his budget. And all of a sudden, he sees up a pop-up Tesla being put on offer, 35K. And he says, hmm, I'm going to give it a try. He calls up the seller. It's a private person, Bob. And he says, Bob, I'm interested in your Tesla. Can I have a test drive? So Andy goes over. Bob invites him over to go and see the car. And he does a test drive in this Tesla. Absolutely love it. Zero to 103 seconds. I mean, it's not too light. So whilst he's doing the test drive, Andy is thinking, right, it's above my budget. The maximum I can pay is 30,000. How am I now going to go and negotiate this? Drives back and he says, I'm just going to make Bob an offer. Steps out of the car and goes to Bob and says, Bob, I do like the car, and I'm going to make you an offer. So Andy says to Bob, Bob, I offer you 27,000 euros for this car. Bob looks at Andy, sticks out his hand and says, you've got a deal. How satisfied do you think Andy is right now? <laughs> Not worried. High, medium, or low? Low. No. low. Why? So lemon. Hmm? He sold him a lemon. Oh, there might be something wrong with the car, yeah. Could be. What else? It was too easy. It was too easy. Now let's turn this example around. So Andy says, Bob, 27,000 euros. Bob says, Andy, you're crazy. No way. And from that moment on, 23 minutes of hard negotiation starts where offers are going back and forth. Bob is really squeezing Andy. And Andy is squeezing Bob as well. And concessions are being made, emotions, hands are being thrown up, Andy is pretending to walk away, Bob is pretending to walk away, sweat is running down Andy's back, and then he says, look, 30,000 euros, that's the maximum I can go to, can you accept 30,000 euros? Bob reluctantly shakes his head. 
How satisfied do you think Andy is now? Low, medium, or high? High. Well, he just paid 3,000 euros more for the same car. So, negotiation is a ritual, a dance, to give satisfaction to the other party, regardless of the outcome. Why is that so important? Because people value the things that are hard to obtain. If it is too easy, people start having doubts. It was too easy. I could have gotten a better deal. Buyer's remorse. Or they start having doubts, saying, oh, it doesn't feel comfortable. So you need to make sure that the other party is satisfied, regardless of How do you make them satisfied? Well, perfect. So don't give in too easy. Can you give us other, or let's explore some other examples where we have this in life, because it's not just when you buy a car. We'll get to you in a second, yeah? Who can give me an example where the same principle works with us human beings, where it's too easy, we don't value something? You can help me out. Yeah, I have a question for you. What happened if you did the negotiation? With Wait, the... We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a second, yeah? I think there is something about to say about too cheap products, because what you see the whole throwaway culture is based uh -huh. on products which are so cheap, we don't value them, we don't repair them. We yeah, them. yeah. Right, when you... But if you work yeah. hard, save money, and then you buy a phone for 500 euros, if you throw it away. That's all about aspiration of the market, right? Mm, <laughs> I think we're talking now about value you give to objects. No, I was, I was agreeing and, with you. And, and money is kind of way of uh, measuring value. Yeah, and talking about products, I've sold courses for more money than I did to other companies, but the other company was still happy. Sometimes you put in a higher price tag. I've raised my prices on my website. More people are coming. I was afraid that less people would come, you know, but my business coach told me, really adding value, it's going to work. Believe me, I was like, because <laughs> it's easy to, to advise someone else, right? But to do it yourself, uh, and now there's more people coming. So sometimes they also see value in a higher price because it seems harder to obtain. It seems more value in there. Yeah. I would say easy promotions. If you get a promotion very easily, then you're probably not being valued by the company in your previous job. Yep. So you're lowballing you and it would make me doubt the company. Exactly. Yeah. Who of you has ever used a dating app? <laughs> what do we do when someone comes across as eager, like overly eager? They really want. We don't like that. Right? It pushes us away a little bit. When someone's too intense, especially with Dutchies, because <laughs> Dutch people are, we're different. <laughs> yeah. Interesting thing here is relativity. It's all about perception. And I'm going to teach you guys a tool later or a concept. Some of you might have heard of it, but most of you have never learned how to use it. We're going to talk about that later. We have two questions. One in the back and then we get to you, okay? Thank you. Who's first? This is for Mark. Uh, imagine that you have, as you presented before, a highly asymmetrical situation of a negotiation. No? You are entering a negotiation in which you already know 90% that you are going to have asymmetrical power if compared to the other counterparty. Assuming that uh, you still need to negotiate, but you don't have any partner, so any uh, best uh, uh, alternative solution to the negotiation agreement. What's, in your experience, one red flag that says, okay, you already know that you are going into this negotiation with a, with, a, with a weaker power. How would you describe a red flag says, okay, now it's time to get pushy, but then now it's time to stop. Otherwise, I'm getting into trouble and still I have no alternative to this negotiation. So, so basically you're asking when to... How do you recognize when to stop pushing? When you enter an asymmetrical negotiation and you know for a fact that you don't have the same power of the counterparty and you have no alternative, but still you gotta play. Broad question. It is. It is. So if I can repeat what I'm trying to answer is how do you know when to accept a deal and when 
to keep on and you are going too far yes yes when when to when to stop there because still you have to yeah. give a little bit of hell let's say but uh, well, if the guy walks away you've gone too far uh, is... um so that's a clear sign which might not even be bad um so in mo some situations you might actually try and antagonize the other party so far to get them to walk away <laughs> but you just need to find a way to get them back in the room or get someone else to get them in the back room if you want it if you want that but and and i think it all well we'll get to a different topic in a bit um you can read behavior. So negotiation is all about reading a person behaviors in the execution of a negotiation. So at one point you can see where they're getting really too frustrated to continue on. The thing with that I would like to share is making a counter proposal oftentimes does not prevent you from capitulating to their last proposal at a later stage. What the problem normally is, is people's ego preventing them that, to do that. If you dissect that, it is, it's always fine to tell, hey, what's your name? Matteo. Matteo. It's fine to say, Matteo, I can't accept that, so can you do 100? And you then say no, and very forcefully and kind of reject it. That's it. That's my, I'm not going to move anymore. Then you can still capitulate. You can say, fine, I'll, I'll accept your terms. So in that case, you can keep on pushing until you've found no more stretch. So you can do that. Uh, and I think that's a lot of times people's worry. I mean, I had to help my wife on her salary negotiation not too long ago. And she was afraid this, but they made me an offer. What if they, what if they don't accept my, uh, my counter offer? And I said, well, what's the worst that's gonna happen? You can still accept their last offer, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But what if they pull the job offer? It's like, well, you know how much effort they've gone into making you that offer in the first place? They're not just going to not take it off the table because you made a counter. So that's a brief answer to that, to that very complex situation because it, it it's really dynamics. But we'll get into a bit more tools you can use later on. Thank you. Yeah. And I want to reiterate the last thing you said about your wife. This is, I think, the most common reason why people not negotiate when, so what I do with former students, clients, I always say, come to me if you want some help. Yeah. I'm not the best negotiator in the world. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. <clears throat> right. But you don't need the best tennis player in the world to teach you some basics with tennis, same with chess and any other skill. So I tell them, come to me if you want some help and lots of people come. <clears throat> Number one objection, but I'm afraid that I will push the other party that they will retract their job offer, that they won't like me anymore. It has never happened in my experience, honestly, that, that they retracted the offer. Of course it does happen that they say, no, sorry, we can't do that. More often it says, okay, they meet in the middle. But I want you to know it's a very normal fear to have, even though it's not really justified, I think, in general. But it's very normal. So I saw a lot of people nodding when you spoke about your wife's fear. It's very normal to feel that. Yeah. My advice, ask someone else. You can be an expert, but also just a friend to help you out with that. Because sometimes we get so tangled in that ourselves and the fears take over. It's good to have someone else guide you and push you a little bit. Questions about that specifically? So talking about this, uh, about your wife getting a new salary, what would you tell them? Uh, because she probably had to get an indication, right? This was a new job. Yeah. Yeah. So what if the indication, the indication after them? What if they meet your job? Uh, so you, don't, you don't give an indication. Well, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Yes, you do give an indication, but we'll get into that later on. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, what happens if you are in a very niche market and you reached satisfaction, but the counterparty just changed his mind at the last moment. So you took one year to negotiate the deal. Imagine it's a merchant acquisition deal. It took one year, a lot of resources, lawyers, due diligence, negotiations, very hard negotiations. Uh, the seller just reduced a lot, a lot his price to reach the counter offer that the buyer offered. 
uh, both parties know like in in this situation in the current situation i will not find another buyer and he will not find another seller but he's just to focus on if i convince him to reduce the price i can convince him to reduce more and the other part is like there's no way i will reduce more so you are like it passing months and you don't close the deal how you can do that you reach a satisfaction both parties agreed on that but the other party just changed his mind at the last moment well then for definition yeah there is no deal yet the, of course. it has not been satisfied so either the minimum thresholds of either parties have not been fulfilled so the zopa has not been been entered into what is zopa zone of we'll get to that we'll get to that. sorry zone of possible agreement so where the overlap is with where a deal is to be made now if you're looking at purely financials there is a quick boundary to that now what I believe you're asking me is, how do I break this deadlock situation? Exactly. Yes. Um, you may have to come to the realization that there is simply no deal possible. Be, right? And then everybody just needs to cut their losses and move on with their lives. Could be. Um, if you have a situation of a deadlock, there's a couple of things that you can do. First of all, change negotiators. That's an easy one uh, because it could be a personal dynamic type of style. And by just simply changing the negotiator, you might get some new insights into the other party that you haven't gotten before because everybody has biases and everybody has built in information at a certain way. For instance, very easy example. What number is that? And six or a nine, depending from which perspective you look Yes. So from your perspective, it's a nine. From my perspective, it's a six. We're seeing the exact same information. However, we're seeing it from different perspectives. And that perspective is super important. Perspectives are personal. So when you have a negotiator who sees the situation from a certain perspective, it may limit you. So by simply changing the negotiator, you can actually already start identifying new options. The other thing I would add, say to that is also get a person to really talk, not the final details, but go back to the beginning. Talk about interests, priorities instead of positions. That's the biggest how, issue. How would you do that? Well, it's it's the way you ask questions. You, If you talk about positions, you're talking about value, about money. You're trying to sell and justify why something is as expensive as you're saying it is or what the value of something is. But if you're talking about priorities, if you start asking the other party, like, okay, let's let's ignore everything we've done in the past and said in the past, but what's important to you? Why, how do you see your future? Just asking a type of questions that will kind of give you more insights into what's going on in their head. Because obviously something is playing that you're unaware of because you haven't addressed it. Yeah? Or you can hire an expert like me and help you out. <laughs> That's an interesting one, though, because what you say is a very specific example. It sounds like something you've maybe had yourself or you, someone else around you have been, has been in that situation. What I've learned, and, and Mark can also test it, is that when you fight among those positions and someone withdraws in the end, it's usually not the position, but it's something underneath, right? Their ego feels hurt. They feel unfairly treated. There's pressure from above. There's, there's always something going on. And if you, what Mark suggests is to go back. So don't talk about the position. Go back to what is, what are the initial, what are the objectives? Where do people want to go? What happens if we don't get a deal? Ask those questions. What? It seems like I, I said something that upset you. It sounds like you see no future in our collaboration. Talk about those things. And then suddenly you will see people go back and they will accept it sometimes. Right? Or they will share, oh yeah, no, I just look. They will say, look, I'm I'm an Arab, a Muslim, and you know, you guys came to our meeting and you were sitting like this, showing your feet at us, and you upset our boss. Oh, so that was underneath it. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just a blunt Dutch underwear person. Okay. Well, how can we make this up? Talk about those things and suddenly it could go back. 
Yeah, and then you can talk about the position again. Is that is that somewhat in line with what you tried to say? Definitely. Yeah. Isn't that then part of collaborative negotiation instead yes. of competitive? Yes, definitely. That is bound. <laughs> it is the definition of the win-win is taking a step back, going to the balcony, as uh, as they said, uh, taking a perspective outside of the positions, taking the priorities. However, what I just described doing is time-consuming. It requires joint willingness from both parties. It requires openness, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So if the other party is not doing that and you are doing that and you're only giving that away, they're going to take it and screw you. I don't do it unless the other party's also. And how would but, you do it? How would you avoid that public situation? Where you're I would always test if the prerequisites are in place. So when I'm being open and transparent with the information, is it reciprocated or not? Or are they just interrogating me and just sticking it in their back pocket? But to finish the example, if the negotiation is reciprocating, or, but the part, the other party is just making time because, okay, to, fi to finish the example, I, I, I told you, uh, they found like a possible other deal, yeah. more cheaper, yeah. but with a lot of paperwork that it's almost impossible to change. But they said, okay, if I found this, in one year, maybe there is something more, but there is nothing more. Yeah. And we both know that, but he's willing to find that. And you have the deadline behind you and you, they ask for results. And you are like pushing, not pushing because it, the, the other person is very senior. That's something also important because you are, if you are younger and you are negotiating with someone of 70 years old, you need to be very careful of what you are saying at that moment. It's, you need to be conscious of people's yes. egos. No, yes, it's exactly. nothing to do with, with but, age. Okay, you need to give a result right now. And it passed more than a year. And everything is, you know the behavior of the other person, you know what they are wanted to do, and you know you have everything developed. So what you will do? Very concretely, because there's a very concrete example, I need to start charging you for this. <laughs> what I what I would do is I, I would issue a warning. So... Not a threat, huge difference between a warning and a threat. I would issue a warning and say, listen, we've got one more shot. What I advise that we do is we lock ourselves up in a room. We get the relevant people in the same room and we just are transparent with each other. Open book, joint problem solving. Go into a room, put a flip chart up and say, share the deeper insights, the priorities, the interests, the, the issues, the undergrounding priorities and interests. Get them out on the table. Not just with two, but with more people, because what I feel that you're also dealing with is you're not dealing with one negotiation, which a lot of people assume. Every negotiation consists of three negotiations, if you're B2B. The one externally with you and me, with the external party, but that person you're negotiating with is also negotiating with their internal stakeholders. And if they're not aligned, and I recently had a very shitty situation where a deal we thought was in didn't go in because they hadn't managed to influence their internal stakeholders properly. So that is what I would advise you concretely to do. How do you manage that? Because you skip that really quick, but how do you manage their internal dialogue? Because you're not seeing that, right? You're only seeing the negotiation going with the party. So you've now asked me two times, so I'm, I'm going to have to get to it. And that is, well, let me sort of start a question. So we, so we do a little break first, or are we having breaks? I can keep going. No, we don't know. It's like I saw someone go to the toilet. So no, 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 they're no. not. They're missing a lot. Of Give us a story. I'll get this. So I'll get to, I'll get to the story. They didn't pee themselves. What I, what I just did, I'll tell you about later. Okay. These, um, who believes you're either born as a good negotiator or not? Hands up if you believe it's it's a skill that you're born to be good at. Talent. Talent. Very good. Ah, fuck. Um, well, I full hardly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's weird, though, that a lot of sales, procurement functions, people are hired and they put on CV, I'm a negotiator, but who of you has ever been tested in their job 
application or interview to actually negotiate. I'd be very surprised if I see some hands right. Have you? Yeah, well, in a very... You have to do a mock negotiation. No, so in a very different kind of situation, I was a teacher for a year. Yeah. And I had to practice negotiating with the students on how to get them... You don't just hit... Calm down. <laughs> laws against that. Yeah. Are there? Not in one when I train. Um, but is it every application or negotiation? No, but... The, so, I... There's a lot of commercial rules out there where people say they're negotiators, but they're not tested on it. And that leads into people automatically assuming that I have a team of sales reps or a team of procurement professionals, and they automatically know how to negotiate. Well, it's never really being tested. When you're talking, so what companies usually do is they test you on other things, right? Your analytical skills. Now, oh, so much. much. Except there's so many tests, but they never test negotiation yeah. skills that's what you're trying to say exactly yeah. Yeah. um and then they don't invest in those people to increase their negotiation skills and then they depend on on the job learning well i've done hundreds of deals so automatically because you've done all of those deals uh you must be a great negotiator i i train ceos i train commercial directors and it's always a struggle for them to get into the training because they say I know how to negotiate. And when they're on the work on our trainings and we put a junior against them, the junior completely wipes the floor with them. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then their ego is completely burst. Yeah, so they love it. And they study right. So how do you become a better negotiator if you're and yes, I do agree there are some human traits that make you better. Number one, emotional intelligence. Why? Because it allows you to get inside the head of the other party a lot easier. And feel comfortable with it because you're in charge of your emotions. So you do have a leg up to become a better negotiator if you have a high EQ. That said, I can turn any of you into a great negotiator. Just give me enough time to prepare you for that negotiation. So um, preparing for a negotiation is all the difference. And it's shocking how poorly people prepare for their negotiation. Because all of those situations, all of those issues can be handled by proper preparation. So if you know how to prepare properly, you can anticipate such a situation as these, or you can at least prepare on how to get out of those situations, as long as you know what to prepare. You ask me, well, we didn't see the other party. We didn't see that third negotiation to be going well. And we did it brilliantly for our internal stakeholders, we had all of those internal alignment sessions. We did all of the internal negotiation before we even went externally. We got the mandate. We were under the assumption, and this was a negotiation, a um, labor relations, a CAO for the Dutch uh, crowd amongst us, where we were negotiating with representatives of the employees, and we were supporting the company in this. Throughout the negotiation, and there were a lot of the, the employee representatives, the room had six of them sitting there. We were under the assumption that they had the buy-in. And then when the deal was coming up for vote, all the employees voted against. Oh, a pretty shit situation. Um, what had gone wrong? Later, we, we actually increased the deal by 0.1%. 0.1%, and we actually got a six month longer duration and they accepted that with peanuts. Um, what went wrong? And that was the way they communicated internally was they weren't excited about the deal. Not in the sense they supported the deal, they had given us the handshake, but when they went back, they just presented it as, and this is, there was no excitement. What signal did that give off to the rest of the employees are like, these guys didn't fight for, my, for me. We could get a lot more. Now, how we could have prevented that and how we captured the lessons learned for the future is every single step of the negotiation, not just waiting at the end of the deal, we are proactively going to communicate to their stakeholders, showing how tough it is to take them with the journey to show them what struggle it is 
because we cannot depend on them doing it properly. So that's one learning. Normally, in other situations where you do not have access to the other parties, do it through proper questioning. Ask them, who are your internal stakeholders? What do they think about this situation? How, how are they perceiving this? In the end, preparation makes the difference. Now, three things that you can do to already drastically increase your negotiation. No, in terms of preparation. First thing that you need to completely know by heart is what's your worst acceptable outcome. Is that your bad now or not? No, that okay. is, doesn't have to be your bad now because you may not have that now. Your worst acceptable outcome. That's the lowest or the maximum you're willing to go. Then you forget about it. Why? Anchoring bias. Why? Where do you want to end up? At your worst acceptable? Hell no. Want to end up at their worst acceptable, which is actually the next thing that you need to do is I then have a guesstimate of where is their worst acceptable outcome. Yeah? What is their worst scenario look like? How far can I push them? And of course, it's a guess because you don't know, because if you did know, you'd maximize all the value. Yeah. Then you, in the most typical negotiation, you open beyond that point. You open extreme. Why? Because you need room to give concessions. So if you're unable to give concessions, you're unable to give satisfaction. So you open extreme so that you can then move. Then the last thing you do is after you've identified your opening position, you define your moves. How are you conceived? Write them down. I've seen too many negotiators winging it. But if you start winging in a negotiation, you become a reactive negotiator instead of a proactive negotiator. The moment you turn into a reactive negotiator, you're going to be steered by the other party instead of steering the other party to where they need to accept the deal. Those are the three tips. If you apply them, you're already going to start seeing drastic results. Will you be satisfied that your worst acceptable outcome? Very good question. Because yes. the other party will also not be satisfied at that point, right? Uh, no, they'll be very well. The Zopa, there might be a very tiny Zopa, which is exactly at that point. Could be. So, and when you're not saying this could be your worst acceptable outcome, yeah. right? It's your line, it's, and this is the Zopa. This is zone of possible agreement. So, what's theirs? What's yours? Yeah, but you're still satisfied with that outcome, right? So, as a negotiator, there is, there should be no place for ego in a negotiation. I've seen people deadlock deals who were here. And then they deadlocked the deal. They had to go explain to their boss and say, yeah, no, uh, we couldn't get to a deal. It's like, huh? How's that possible? Did you offer them the hundred? No, 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 I stuck at 120 because I thought they would accept it. Well, they didn't, and you walked away. That's a career-killing move right there. Yeah? This happens a lot. Huh? That, I've seen this egos, yeah. and the more is at stake, the so, more. So watch out the ego aspect. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. yeah. Well, question and comment. I think uh, one of the things that was very clear from all the questions was that a lot of times they go into the negotiation without any power in the negotiation, yeah. right? So they, I, I guess in these cases, you shouldn't even go in the negotiation if you don't have the power to walk away because then your SOPA can go all the way uh, where the provider wants. If you're, you are the last glass of water in the desert and it's like, you give me your house for your for this glass of water, yeah. it's, it's the, either the water or you die. Yeah. Getting your mandate, getting your, uh, and that all boils down to preparation. I mean, this whole aspect of preparation, I just gave you a very brief tactical preparation. We specialize as a company in preparation and we prepare negotiations nine months to a year in advance. Why? Because then you can start influencing the other party even before they even think that they are negotiating. I don't want to be influencing the other party when they think I'm already in the negotiation. Why? Because then their defenses go up. Yeah. So ooh, I want to talk about that later. But first, we'll get to questions more. But uh, first, one, so I've got you and you, right, for questions later. I want to talk about this, the third step. Because 
I feel this is the most effective negotiation tool you can use pretty much in, in any negotiation in life. What does this signal? What is this? I'm really bad at drawing and writing. So Mountain core. it's an anchor. Who of you has heard of anchoring? Okay, most of you, most of you. Can you explain? Yes, it means that you uh, come with a certain uh, offer. And uh, if that uh, becomes like a, a reasonable, mm -hmm. then you are making the next move as they relate to that uh, anchor. Yeah, so the anchor is a reference point. And remember, I told you earlier, the reference, the relativity is key. So I have a company with a friend of mine. And a few years ago in the pandemic, it was booming because we give trainings in off, uh, sorry, in online software skills. Yes, yeah, so we train the boomers on how to use Teams, Zoom, etc. <laughs> right now, you might laugh like who needs a training in Zoom, but if you get your parents or grandparents, their generation have no clue. Okay, so we did. It was fun. It still is, and. I want to tell you about my companion, my my buddy Timon. And Timon is a, is a, a proper nerd in a lovely way. He's very detail oriented. He loves software. He understands everything. I'm pretty useless. I just know how to talk and listen. But we made a good combination there. So a company came to us, said, "Hey, we want ten workshops for our team. For our teams, they they have no clue how to use Microsoft Teams." How much is it going to cost? That's what they ask quite early. What do, do you always answer when when people come to you and ask, what is it going to cost? No. Um, exactly. Well, complicated answer. It's not an easy answer because if I don't know what their requirements or their demands are yet, I'm not going to give them a price because I first want to know what their needs are before I exactly. anchor it. Big mistake people make. Yeah, they immediately give their price. Be conscious about it. It's also preparing, right? So we used to sit down before, before we had this call with the client. Okay, the lead is hot. They've been following us for a while. We know there's a big chance we could get this as a client. We prepare, sit down. So what is it going to cost? I'll, obviously, that depends on how much we're going to do for you, what the requirements are, how many people, etc. Yeah. Then you nurture their emotions, their ego. Oh, it seems like you really care about your team which was true, right? We're not lying. We're just building a rapport. Then at one point, okay, we want to get a proposal from you. So Timon was really good with the software. And what he usually does is he will make the proposal and then I'll check it. So he made a proposal, 10 workshops. Let's say it was 15K. Yeah. I teased him on. He sent a proposal to me. I said, Dude, you can't do this. This is, you're joking, right? He started freaking out. Like, what? Is there a mistake? You know, because he's very detail oriented. I said, man, you cannot do this. This is ridiculous. It's like, it's too high, right? They're going to say no. I said, no, man. It's way too low. He's like, what? Way too low. I said, yeah. If we send this to them, we're going to probably say immediately yes. Okay, so what do we send then? I said, hmm, how about 26? I just did this, right? Mm -hmm. Number like that. It's like no way they're going to say yes to that. So what? They want to work with us. They're boomers. <laughs> they love us young people we're in energetic they've seen our team they really want to work with us so we want them to say no to this but we're going to use it as an enemy. of course we got to no. know sometimes they say yes by the way <laughs> they, then you know you're oh man i could have got higher <laughs> i said no sorry this is not within our budget so what did i do i said oh, okay well what is your budget or what are, what should we think about Maybe we can scrap one workshop. Maybe we can change a little bit. In the end, we got like a deal around 22K. Okay. 
let me tell you, they were happier with this deal. They were more satisfied, the other party, than if I would have said this and they immediately accepted. Because now they felt they really negotiated for it. They got the most value. And this is the power of an anchor. That's what Mark tried to say with the third step. So the anchor is a reference point. Now, there might be objections now. What if the anchor is too crazy? What if it's too high or too low? How do you deal with that? So, so let's first bring it back to the original question about salary. When they ask you, what are your salary expectations? Um, I would always answer that. Why? Because it's a perfect opportunity to throw out your anchor. Exactly. Yeah. The, the key thing that you need to do is where do you base your expectation on? Do you base it on what you're currently earning? My face should have already said, no, you do not. You base it on the research and the preparation that you've done. With today's information, it's crazy what you can find out. Think. Put on your naughty boots and just give a person at that company a call or reach out or who you know that is in a similar role and ask them, what do you do? And then ask for a range. Or ask for, yeah, ask them for, hey, what range should I be expecting for this position? Or can I have a catch up? What, uh, don't call the hiring manager, of course, but call <laughs> someone else and ask them, hey, I'm uh, keen to join your company. And uh, I just, uh, yeah, we're developing quite further on into the uh, into the interviews. Can, can you just give me a, a heads up on what the potential race can be? But to, today with Glassdoor and all the other tools out there, you should be able to identify what the salary range is. Now, of course, set your expectation at the higher end of that range. As long as you're not asking anything completely ridiculous, it's a high anchor. Yeah. And it will also show the value to the other company, because if you give them the upper end of the range, they're going to say, oh, hold on. They're going to automatically make their own assumptions that oh, this person must already be earning somewhere near that because maybe earning, yeah. I, I managed to increase my wife's salary rules ago by 40K, four zero. That's she was a good employee, right? No, she actually wasn't. Uh, the company really wanted to hire her and they've already been working together. But they had, so she was actually the, uh, the supplier manager to that company. And they just had a massive perception of what her function was. Whilst in their current company, she didn't get, or in their last company, she didn't get the promotion opportunities uh, that she deserved. So we went in at the high anchor. Well, no, with the anticipation saying, well, they would probably assume that I'm this job group. Mm -hmm. And we sat at the higher range of that. Uh, but what happens if, because, I mean, this is all also with the example of the trainings, right? This is also very nice if you put in a high anchor, but you will very quickly come to the date. 26,000, know, your cost price is 15,000 if they start asking you for data. So they will ask you for a breakdown of your cost structure. Yeah. And then you have to start lying. This also happens as soon as they ask you for like your raw space or something. What, what do you, how do you move away from that? Because if you're not. Who's ever been heard a recruiter asking you for their last pay slip? Really? Yes. Yeah, uh, I've done it. Uh, I've done it. Uh, no, no. Have you, have you actually shared it with them? I, I would say that's a highly inappropriate question to ask. I know people who've shared it. I know. Yeah. Because you really want to work there. You want to be yeah. a nice person. Crazy. That, that goes, I, I'm not even sure if that's legally allowed. Depends, depends on the jurisdiction, probably. It depends on the jurisdiction. Why doesn't? No, that's swindle. Don't show it because if you don't show it, you demolish your negotiation power, right? Well, you say, hey, this is, uh, this is, uh, I, you don't sit. Hi, then. Hold on. But there's two aspects here. If you said my job expectation is I want to earn 100K because that's what I'm earning now, well, then you're opening yourself up for a load of shit. Yeah. yeah? Because if you say, well, my ex my expectations are 100K, that 
then if your current pay is 50, there'd be a whole bunch of reasons why it's 50. But you don't, do not ever put your in, yourself in a position to be caught lying. So do never, never in a salary negotiation say, my current earnings are. Never say that. You shouldn't be sharing that in the first place. You just say, my job expectations, my salary expectations, or my benefit expectations are this. And if they ask you to share a pay slip saying, no, that's highly private. I'm going to share that with you. But what if they ask you your current salary? Then you, like then you say, well, my expectations of this job is that I'm going to be earning this. Answer with a different answer. What I like to do, you could also try is answer with a question. Yeah. So you could ask, well, you expect me to share my salary? Would you share yours? Just to show how ridiculous it is. You could say, what would happen if I share my salary? What would my boss think of that? It goes also from the, I mean, there's a reason why you're applying, right? Because you're not happy with your current job, with either the pay or the dynamic of the culture, whatever, you're leaving. That should not be the benchmark of your future salary. Oh, and you're not getting paid your new salary, exactly. your old salary for a new job. So do not let HR determine your future salary based on what you're currently earning, because completely different dynamics, different expectations, different efforts in the work, essentially. Um, so far, everything you've sort of really described here has been a single variable negotiation, mostly salary, money, uh, in a two-party yep. negotiation. Can you sort of open it up towards, you know, multi-variable negotiations and multi-party, three, four, whatever party negotiations? How would some of this change in sort of that circle? With time. <laughs> or was that, was that a terrible question? I mean, the, the reason why we're not covering it, because we're pretty much covering the basics. Okay. Uh, and if you want to get into a lot of that more complex negotiation, well, the basics still apply. You need to prepare a lot okay. more detail. Yeah? Yeah. When is a good sorry, number to... I want to add one more thing, because this was a really good question. What if they ask you about your justifications? Some of you might have noticed I put a not what is it called? A non-rounded number. I would even put some zero digits or you know, some decimals, as they call. Because people take that as a more justified number than if you just say this. If you say 15K, they feel like, you know, that's... But if I come with a number like this, you can also use it in the salary negotiation. You can say, hey, I've calculated my value now. I've looked at Glassdoor. I want to buy a house next year. This is what I expect. And then you come with a number like this, they take more... You see it as a more credible number. Really works. Mark, what is a good number to play with the benchmark? For example, now with Blastor and in some job offers, they also put the range of salary they are offering right now. And of course, if you are a freelance and you go like he's hitting like yeah, 30K, I mean, all the clients can go to the market and start to compare prices, just asking by phone, like how much it costs. And a lot of companies are going to tell you the price, but we recommend some like Average about 30% above the benchmark or 20%. Or tomorrow, if I want, I will tell a client 50K. If you pay me, great. I mean, just to give some more transparency to answer this question, there's there's a lot of people offering negotiation training. So do we. And there's a lot of people out there that are offering negotiation one day training for a thousand bucks, 1500 We charge 11,000 per day for eight people. Now, I get that question a lot. Say, why are you, I'm gonna pay you 11,000 euros for a day of your time? But yeah, but I can get it for 1500. Good luck with that. Enjoy. You're not paying me for my time. Definitely not. You're paying me for my expertise, skills, and everything, and the value that I will bring, and I know I can bring your organization. That's what you're paying me for. I can even guarantee you the results of that. So it's difficult to position that in salary negotiations, but you could say, hey, I know the range is between a thousand or a hundred K and 150 K, but I'm exceptional. I can guarantee you that I will bring you in more sales, save you more money. So 
me knowing that, me being confident in that, I'm going to expect a higher salary than the average what the other people are earning. If you want average, you hire them. If you want exceptional, you hire me. How you position yourself. Yeah, also the confidence you bring into that conversation. That brings us back to the Zopa again. Because the Zopa, like what you expect, is just very high. Right? And if they will say, look, we want something cheaper, sure. But then there's no possible agreement. There's a there's other traders out there. You, you need a reputation for this, right? Because if you if you get a bad reputation, then you overprice and then you immediately lose all your clients. Yeah, especially if you're new. Yeah. Um, but that's why I build off my reputation. You also select your clients, right? You select your clients because if you get if you get like unwilling clients that you have to force into the trading or they're not complying with the trading or will give you a bad review, then you have a you have a higher down risk of them giving a bad rep you, you a bad reputation than money you won't earn from that. Luckily that hasn't happened. Uh I past that phrase when it does. Um it, it is much more difficult when we do consulting because with consulting we do set expectations and the expectations are high that we will actually drastically increase results. And yes, we do have a reputation and we have testimonials and we have experience where we can show that investing a euro in us will pay itself back 17 fold. Trust us. Uh, but yeah, of course you don't start. If I were to start this without the experience I have, I wouldn't be charging yeah. the rates that I charge. Very simple. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm also a negotiator. So I'm always trying to maximize the value yeah, of the deal. Yeah. Yeah, I just had the same question, like if I flip it over and then if I ask, how do I address on the other side of the table when somebody's saying, oh, you, you know what, I bring more value and then you're going to pay me 11,000. So how do I bring that down? Proof, preparation. What are the challenges they're going to give you? Um, have you done your homework or can you, sh can you pick? So why do people, pay, first of all, why do you think people pay me the money that they pay me for helping them with their negotiation? And the simple answer is when I don't go in with a request to say, hey, Mark, can you send me an offer? Like exactly what, what he just described. Can you sell me an offer about what's the cost? I tell them, I, <laughs> I cannot determine the cost. I first need to understand your problem. And in that time, and it's usually a very short amount of time. I mean, just yesterday I got called by, by a CEO of a company who has a very concrete problem. And in that hour call, I was able to share my insight, my information, my knowledge, where he says, yeah, you are the guy that I need to work with because I feel confident you're going to address all the issues that I have. And that starts with having the knowledge to be able to identify the issues that he has. And the issues that they have is usually not the problem they think they have. It's usually the underlying issues that are causing that problem. And if you're able to, and that takes experience. So in that case, you kind of first build the trust and then you're trying to gain their uh, uh, buy-in. So all business relationships yeah, are so based on trust. On the, in the negotiation, you don't know, for example, you're, you're just engaging for the first time. And, and then you haven't prepared. Yeah, so they, they should- It always goes back to preparation. It always goes back to preparation. If you, if you, the one tip I can give everyone, prepare. Nobody does it. Nobody does it well. And the people who do it, they limit themselves to tactical preparation. Oh, I'm going to open on this number and then concede, which is also very important. Don't get me wrong. I just told you to do that. But to really make a difference, you need to prepare a lot deeper. Well, help, help me understand that. Why don't people prepare that? Is it discipline? Is it, what is it? It's... Boring. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's not appealing. No, it's it's really it's grunt work. It's tough. It's difficult. It's annoying. You have to put in the you have to self motivate, and all of you are all constantly on your phones looking at your next TikTok. It's difficult to get into the details. I understand. Yeah, but that's where the difference is made. Let me disagree one second with you, Mark. If I humbly can. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> Yes, it's, uh, it's removing the fear of failure outside of that, that blocks you. You don't want to be prepared because at the same time you fear the, the fear of failure, but 
somehow you feel that you can improvise doing something like that, even an I stake negotiation. Okay. So if you remove that, or better yet, you make the fear of failure work for you so that you are afraid. And then according, as I always like to say, don't be scared, be prepared. Yeah. Or be a little less. less so, so, yeah. So winging it, fear of failure, uh, I've always done it. Sometimes people just don't know what they're leaving. I mean, if you ask a typical key account manager, if they're great negotiators, most of them will say yes. Oh, I close deals, I'm hitting my targets. What they're not being asked is how much money are they leaving on the table? And that's actually an interesting sign. I, I found that if they are very confident, to me, that's usually a sign that they overestimate. It's the same with public speaking. A lot of professors here at the university think they're pretty good public speakers or they're quite decent. But if we look at your experiences, <laughs> it's the same there. The most, we'll get to you, the most experienced negotiators I've seen in podcasts and everything, they're always quite humble. They will say, yeah, I, I trust myself, but I don't know everything. I prepare, right? I search for the unknown things. I ask questions. How you said your uncle? Yes, sir. Waiting for such a long time. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, for a salary negotiation, would the best way to prepare be, uh, as you mentioned already, like look through the internet, what the salary range are, or connecting, for example, with uh, employees or some other business? Or is there something more we can do that you would suggest to better prepare for that? Well, it really depends. Are you in an existing job or are you going for a new job as well? Um, so it, it really depends also on that situation on what you need to prepare for. It is also asking. So uh, an interesting one is the um, I, I was helping a, a friend of mine out who was applying for a commercial role and a, a sales role. And they had massive expectations in sales targets. They had a very lucrative bonus system to that as well. And then I told them, OK, this, this sounds very interesting, but why don't you ask them how many clients they have right now? Because the sales bonus targets, they were like, yeah, I need, need to get annually 30 clients. They need to have over two, 20 million of revenue bringing in. And if you achieve all of that, you're going to get a massive bonus. And he asked, how many clients do you have now? How many do you get new clients a year? And then it was completely ridiculous what they were asking. So that is the other preparation is validate your job. Like validate what are they asking you to do? So that's one. So yes, go into the nitty gritty detail of what is expected. That's also kind of a, a, a hard lesson learned that I had in my career is make sure there is a detailed job description and completely tease out the line manager because the worst thing you can do is end up in a job where they're trying to figure it out on the way, especially in large companies, because you're going to get stuck somewhere. You're not going to move up. Um, the other point is, um, be, be confident to ask around. My sister got a promotion at a large corporate company and they offered her a job and that was a big pay increase of what she was already earning. And then she, are, and she was going to be the youngest and female in that position. Then she started asking around. And she found out that these old farts, <laughs> white males, were earning literally 40% more than her. Even if she got that increase, she's like, what the hell is this? And uh, yeah, but they're experienced. I hate that word, especially in jobs. Experience, experience. Well, you're hiring me to do the exact same job. What's experience got to do with it? So ask around, find out and challenge. And I dare to say that a lot, and then also females, unfortunately, don't dare to have that difficult conversation. I had to coach my sister through that entire process, what she was going to say, how she was going to stay, be also quite threatening to the company because it's actually really discriminative. So she spent all the salary increase in you. 
<laughs> you got the family right no. <laughs> what is it i want to add something that i've not personally experienced but a lot of female friends and clients of mine there's also an element there where females are more punished very generally speaking more punished for questioning and asking there's also bias in general a woman tends to and this might be uncomfortable for men here they'll feel like no i wouldn't be like that a part of the gender pay gap, for example, is because if a woman asks for more, she's more easily seen as bossy or demanding compared to men. There's a lot of research out there which shows that. Very interesting thing. So I'm going to make you aware of that as well. Last question before think, we're going to finalize. Yeah, I think you, uh, the guy in front of me was first, right? Or... Oh, yeah, he's the host. Totally. But I, I would like to ask a question as well. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it was not clear. I mean, I understand your perception about the anchor and the prices and everything. And I want to make the same question to you because you are starting and everything and you have another vision of that. And I'm in the same situation. So for me, it's important to know, for example, if I send my anchor too high, even if I know my value, nobody will hire me <laughs> because I don't have that experience in this country at least. Yeah. So what is the best option to set an anchor to negotiate with a prospect after you did the lead. Do you think yourself? The benchmark and start to compare. And if it's too cheap, raise the value. I mean, normally when you resell, for example, the average percentage you increase is 30%. If you sell something, so you need to put that on the calculations and do your homework. No, if you don't have the product, but you are doing a partnership with some software developer and they charge you 8,000, so you will sell it, you will sell it 30% more to the person who asked you for it. So it's something similar with the anchor when you are providing services. If you don't have that, just just one prestige. Are you are you making hourly rates proposals? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Depends on the needs. I I have a client who wants to sell something in September, so he wants lead generations. Just just, just a more. Advice, just up there. Read Million Dollar Consulting by Alan Rice. If you read that. It will change the way that you're going to do services, especially if you're charging sometimes hourly rates. You repeat mm -hmm. that. I'm going to million dollar consulting, Alan Weiss. And what's your one key takeaway from that book that you would share with the room? Yeah. One sentence. Yes. Don't charge hourly rates. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I because barely, I barely ever charge, but there, there is, there's a, there's a, there's a maximum of what you can charge by hourly rate. If I were to translate my rates down into hours, nobody's going to pay me for that. Because then I'd have to justify why I'm hourly earning more than their CEO, which I can't justify in yep. their eyes. But I can justify my project rates based on the value that I bring to them. Last question for now. Yeah, we, we, we've been talking a lot about the position of the negotiator in terms of salary negotiation. So... Uh, the candidate perspective, but uh, I suppose what the, the employer's perspective, you know, uh, in, as part of the preparation phase, how do you sort of counter due diligence from their side uh, regarding your own salary? So they might, for example, reach out to your manager and ask, uh, what's the salary? So do you have any best practices on how you can counter that type of diligence on their side? In that specific example, when they go to your manager? Yeah internal alignment that's and that's any negotiation not salary negotiation because that risk you run with any negotiation is that people start asking not the negotiator but people around them for information internal alignment to identify in preparation who may they contact and make sure that you've briefed them if they contact you tell them revert them back to me or tell them this or tell them that it's, it, I mean, a big part of my work is in, in complex deals is making sure that there is internal alignment, having mapped out all the stakeholders, having made sure everyone has the Q&A, they know what to say, when to say, and when to pass it on. Okay, and what if that goes wrong? What if they didn't do it? What would you advise? Fire them? <laughs> <laughs> no, but your clients. Say it happens on the client side. They come to you, hey, Mark, um, someone told my manager. They gave a different number. I don't know what to do now. That's kind of your question, right? How do you deal with that situation? 
well, you'd like the best thing is to avoid that situation in the first place. And if that has happened, I mean, if it is in the realm of possibility, you might have already just lost a big part of that negotiation power. Or you can say, well, he made a mistake. It happens. He assumed different variables than what we're assuming. So and with he, you mean the manager? Your manager. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just call him a blabbering fool. <laughs> probably ask them that. That's okay. Huh? As a final exercise, I want you all to write down, if you can, you can use your phone. Two things that you're going to take away from today. And one thing you're probably going to forget. What's the control thing? Okay, so write your two favorite things from today. And one thing you're probably going to forget. Please write them down. You have one minute. You don't need. And he should have said, write it down on paper, because then it sticks better than writing it on the phone. Yeah, but not everyone has paper, right? Because they're ill-prepared. How <laughs> <laughs> much time is the preparation? Uh, I always get this question. Like, it, it's 20? No, it's 90 to 1 hour. Okay. I... I, I I spend, uh, as I said, I've spent a year and a half preparing for a negotiation, influencing all the other parties. Um, the more time we have, the better we can get the results. Now, I just want to make a comment because I think that's why your business model is so smart. Because you may, my, might sell a day training, but you spend tons of preparation already before you even make the offer. Yeah. And that has to be covered by this. But of course. Set. So to say my business model is from public companies that that's actually what it starts to work. We we are just re <laughs> we are just rebranding and we are because we are very specialized in this whole preparation bit. And we are just going through this whole rebranding exercise. So we are now following the tagline of negotiation architects. Yeah. Well, but that's that's why. Negotiation architect, design of preparation. Yeah. Okay, so the question was two things that you're gonna take away. One thing you're probably going to forget. Any volunteers to share one thing you're going to take away? Again, as I've told you before, don't be scared, be prepared. And uh -huh. uh, no shame in opening eyes. Okay, I love it. Anyone else on this side? Yeah, no room for egos. No room for egos. Rather, what reason why you want to keep your managers out of the negotiation? <laughs> what I'd like to tell myself often is, Younger, don't let your ego get in, cross, uh, get in front of what you want or what you need, right? Sometimes I need, and this is also personal relationships. Oh, my ego is blocking now from actually asking or sharing my boundary or what I need. It happens a lot. Your ego gets in between what you want or need and you. You. What do you want to, what are you going to take away? Ever discuss your okay not uh, never discuss your currency if they ask you and they're going to do this as well and, and i think also nowadays with um if you want to get a mortgage mm -hmm. they also ask you a thing for your studies schuld, your student debt stuff like that you don't have to share that legally right <laughs> there is a tiny gray area about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've changed. Yes, you need. Anyway, I didn't share it <laughs> because I responded with a question. But you got a mortgage, so you're lucky already no. with these rates. <laughs> uh, can I ask one one th last thing, Phil? I want to hear from one because we have we have to finalize now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. One thing you're gonna forget. Three drinks. You're gonna forget the free drinks. I got free drinks. No free drinks. There's no reason I came. Zopa. <laughs> Zopa. It's an acronym I've always forgotten. <laughs> Zone possible potential. Potential agreement. <laughs> what are you gonna do? So actively trying to negotiate with the internal sectors other than the body of note. Yes. And can I just give you one tip? Negotiators don't ask. They don't ask, can I ask a question? They just ask the question, so go ahead. Just ask me. Uh, well, you do this for a living. Yeah. So what are you...
what do you do when you're re when you are reaching your worst acceptable outcome? Because you probably hate that. So, what do you do? Because I have one. I'm doing this for free. Yeah, but is this your was this your worst acceptable? <laughs> <laughs> that free drink was, and now I found out there are no. Um, no, that's, there's always value, and and for for me, the the amount paid doesn't necessarily represent the value. I'm still considered a startup. We're still growing the business. It's going fantastic, but we're still four guys. We need the lady soon. Why is it that DNI thing is going to play up? Um, but we need to grow the business, and sometimes it requires me to concede. I am, however, very conscious with big corporates because they'll try and squeeze price to not set precedents towards the future. So I'd often walk away from big corporate gigs versus smaller companies who I know simply don't have the budget. And then I'd rather do that to get my reputation out there. And actually, I, I can boast that my results are fantastic because I've also helped such companies gain massive results. So it's it's always a play. I'm not that stuck on my rate because I know value is also also. I wasn't precisely talking about money here. Okay, the overall package, right? Yeah. So it, to me, if it makes sense, like you're reaching that, you just said like I'm going to go. This is my bottom line, and it could be composed of money, but side benefits, exposure, whatever you decide is the bottom. When you're reaching there, uh, do you get to a point where you're like, no, I'm. I'm this is not going to be beneficial, and you stop. I walk away. Okay. Yeah, you walk. Yeah, I walk away. I mean, you uh, shall always be willing to walk away in the negotiation. If you're not, you're just desperate. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. Yeah. No deal is sometimes better or always better than a bad deal. No deal better than a bad deal. So walk away yeah. if necessary. Can I get a really warm applause for Mark? share contact details yes of course yeah absolutely so yes. if you want to hire mark i'm pretty sure they're going to share these yeah. yeah. stuff yeah. 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 maybe share we got an email okay yeah. 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 thanks sure. yes final yeah. word from me by the way um i don't know if i'll be at the drinks long because i'm not feeling very fit what I wanted to tell you is this negotiation stuff. You can always ask me for free, but if you want the proper deal, go to Mark. <laughs> if you want my, my bread and butter is in public speaking. So if you feel anxiety for public speaking, definitely reach out to me. Of course, that's going to cost you something, but with negotiations, I'm always happy to help <laughs> now. One day I'll be where Mark is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you guys. Yep. Let's your job. So um, I also wrote down three things, but I didn't follow the assignment. I wrote down three things I wanted to thank you both for. Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, thank you for coming. It's so lovely to work with you. And we really appreciate uh, you coming back to show us. And I hope you've inspired some people here. We, we hope to see you all come back to speak for us uh, in the future. Um, the second thing, I want to thank you for collaborating together to do this. Um, it's true, they didn't know each other before. <laughs> and I kind of put you together and said, these two might be, go well together. And um, the third thing I wanted to think about was um, your style. It, it Actually, you can't tell that you've only just met. Your dynamic is, is really lovely together. Um, thanks for not uh, boring us with a long presentation. The, the conversational style, I think, worked really well. So thank you. We have a good Oh, goodie bad. Yeah, and free, free drinks. So <laughs> thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, what is next? We are uh, going to leave here. We're going down to Maria's. If you're not sure, it's at the end of the hall. Um, we'll have a break. You can uh, go to the bathroom if you need to. And then at five thirty, Dr. Julia Mel is going to take us through a fantastic networking session. I have heard amazing reviews about this session. I haven't seen it myself, so we're really looking forward to it. It has a lot of practical uh, elements to it that I think you'll all find very useful. And then after that is dinner. And then we're going to kick you out at eight because we all want to watch the football at nine. <laughs> <laughs> See you at Marie's. <laughs>